The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. You guys are doing very well so far in this class, so I figured we could do something special. Um, in talking with you guys, we have a lot of design parts that are undergoing high temperatures, high pressures, high amounts of irradiation, and there are a lot of nuclear engineering specific concerns as well as general concerns with dealing with metals in extreme environments, and I would be remiss if we let you guys out of here, as in an MIT, without at least hearing about some of these things and where they're important to nuclear reactors. And since a lot of these concepts are fairly abstract and without a material science background, it's hard to absorb. It's a little easier to absorb while you're absorbing something edible at the same time that behaves strikingly similar. So this all started when I took a cheese tasting class for my birthday, courtesy of one of my friends. And while they were prattling on about terroir and all these other wonderful things that go into cheeses, I was sitting there breaking them and being like, oh my god, they <laughs> behave just like metals, like this one is <laughs> This one undergoes creep. This one is undergoing stretch corrosion cracking. This is insane. So <laughs> I put together a few of my favorite cheeses along with their accompaniments, and I thought I'd share them with you, um, since you guys are doing so well. Just to tell you what cheeses we have. Um, on your plate, from your point of view, at 12 o'clock, we have the uh, Cabot cheddar. And at See, I'll just break up the clock into these five parts right here. At about two o'clock, we have a comté. At, but, uh, that's a French cheese. At four or five o'clock, it's a sheep's milk cheese called Cluby uh, Abbe de Belloc. At, what do we have? About seven or eight o'clock. This one's quite nice. It's a uh, truffle cheese from Italy, Sotto Cenare al Tartufo. And at 10 or 11 or whatever o'clock, what do we have? Oh, yeah, the queso azul, blue cheese from Spain. And as we get into each of these cheeses, I'll get into what's special about the cheese, its accompaniments, and then we'll get into how it behaves fairly like metals. So, what is the deal with this class? I think I already explained this stuff. Many of you are using metals at high temperatures and pressures. Uh, I know the core group is using a quenched and tempered steel, and not everybody knows what the words quenched and tempered mean. Who, who doesn't know what quenched or tempered means? So more than none. So that's the point, especially folks in the core group. So if you're going to be using these sorts of words and talking about metals in extreme environments, you need to know what you're talking about. Uh, but this, hopefully this cheese class will help you get a little bit better understanding of some of these things. So, for those who haven't had 22070, I want to go over a little bit of the general structure of metals. Metals tend to be composed of grains. Uh, this is actually the iron 12 chrome 2 silicon alloy that uh, I did for my PhD thesis and the core group is depending on for corrosion resistance. Grains tend to be in these regions here of fairly continuous crystal structure, so each one of those could be approximated as a single crystal and the boundaries between them are known as grain boundaries. So that's just to get a little bit of uh, background lingo so we're all on the same page. A couple more examples. This is a piece of the rotor, the power rotor that powers Alcator CMOD. Uh, this rotor was, take, was slated to be taken out of service for reasons unknown, so we actually had to take some cuts out of it, look at the grain structure, and prove that it was indeed fit for service. And in the, in the process, we got to see the general grain structure of these rotor steel alloys. So I'd like you to take a look at your cheddar cheese. That's the one at 12 o'clock. If you'll notice, if you look closely, cheddar cheese tends to have grains as well, um, or we call them curds. So here, if you want to come up, grab a plate with cheese, actually. <laughs> uh, the whole idea. Um, if you look at the cheddar cheese, you'll notice it actually has a grain structure. Um, when the cheese is made, the, uh, the, the cheese is sort of coagulated using a rennet, which is an enzyme that either comes from the thistle or from a calf's stomach or another animal's stomach, and it forms these curds. And in cheddar cheese, 
this curd is actually cut up a little bit and they're pressed together. It's actually called a cheddaring process along the salt. And what happens is it forms that nice granular structure. So if you want to pick up a piece of the cheese and break it apart, so this is just sort of a, a larger view of the cut surface of cheddar. If you want to break it apart, take a look at the surface and, you know, smell it, appreciate it, whatever you want, but mainly look at the surface. It may look strikingly similar on a different scale. For those of you who were in recitation on Friday, to the W1 tool steel that we quenched and shattered in the forge, you end up with all of these nice facets, these crisp, clean facets, and this is what's known as intergranular fracture as intergranular, meaning between the grains, as opposed to transgranular or intragranular, which would be through the grains. Um, and I just thought that th these pictures, besides the fact that this one is made of cheese, are strikingly similar. <laughs> this is a picture of sensitized 304 stainless steel, which is used all over nuclear reactors. And this is cheddar cheese. And take a look at your cheese, take a look at the microstructure here, and you'll notice I don't, can't really see a difference <laughs> if that weren't in Um The pairing with the cheddar cheese, which by the way is at um, 12 o'clock, yeah. is the, it's uh, Willis Woods pure apple cider jelly, and that really is what I mean. It's just nothing but apples. About 30 to 50 apples go into every pound of this cider jelly, and they're both from Vermont. So, factory in the Union of Okay. In case there was a question, yeah. Hi, Rob. There's no New Hampshire cheese. <laughs> there are a few, actually, just not on this plate. Right. Um, and anyway, what I tried to do is give you accompaniments with cheese and whatever goes with it from as similar locations as possible, so you can sort of see, get a feel for the region. Wasn't able to do that in every case, but in this case, it worked out pretty well. So I'd like you guys to try the cheese on its own. Just sort of take a little bite, breathe in, breathe out. A lot of the nice part of the cheese is when you take in and exhale air and building all of those glands in your nose with the wonderful things that happen to cheese when it breaks up and oxidizes and things. Then try pairing it with the apple cider jelly and notice that something that's sort of sweet and tart helps cut a lot of the fat from the cheddar cheese. Cheese does have a pretty high fat content and we'll be going through a little bit of it. Um, the cheddar cheese is a cow cheese which is a medium fat content. If you look at about 4 o'clock on your plate the Bhubi Abai de Beloc, uh, or Abai de Beloc, that's a sheep's milk cheese. Sheep's milk tends to be pretty high in fat. You might notice that that cheese is already starting to sweat. Or is anyone noticing that? Yeah, okay. That's actually fat sort of oozing out of it. Um, we'll get to that in a second. So moving on, at 2 o'clock, I want to talk about supersaturation and phase precipitation. Um, the cheese at uh, 2 o'clock is a Comte de Faux from Jura in France, and that's paired with a local confiture of black cherries, um, not from not too far away. Um, this comté is pretty interesting. Before you eat it, and it's gone, I want you to take a look at it. Everyone should have a sample of the comté cheese that has a cut face, and it should have a torn face. And I want you to notice, what do you see about this? Does anyone notice anything striking about this cheese? Is it just uniform? No. What do you see? Little, little lobs. Little lobs. Okay. Now take a bite and chew it pretty well and tell me what happens. It's like a crunch bar. You weren't expecting a crunch in cheese, right? Yeah, it's like a, it is like a crunch bar, like little crunchy bits in it. Those are crystals of lactic acid formed during fermentation of the lactose in the cheese. <clears throat> And the formation of lactic acid secondary particle precipitates in Comte de Faux is very similar to the formation of secondary particle precipitates, or SPTs, in circuloids, which are used as fuel cladding for light water reactors. Uh, the dissolved elements, what makes zircaloy, zircaloy is not just the zirconium, but whatever else you add in it, whether you add some tin or iron or uh, what else, antimony, or whatever else you need to add, um, sometimes these things precipitate out as secondary particle precipitates, one of which can be seen here in the sample of oxidized zircaloy. This is a TEM foil, so these little dots, well, I can't really tell if they're pixels or atoms, but they're about the same scale on this photo. This distance here is half a nanometer. Um, and this area right here is actually a secondary particle precipitate of tin oxide inside the zirconium oxide. 
And these secondary particle precipitates help strengthen the material as well as increase its oxidation resistance. Um, and another example would be carbides precipitating in steel. So what makes steel what it is? Or someone just tell me, what is steel in its simplest form? Iron and carbon. Um, it turns out that a lot of steels have more carbon than is soluble in iron or ferrite normally. And you end up precipitating out all these little dark regions here are carbides. Just like you end up precipitating out lactic acid in this Comte de Faux. And then while you enjoy that along with the uh, cherries, so again, um, just to go back a little bit, I recommend trying the cheese on its own. Oh, I'm sorry, the, the Comte de Faux is on its own. Comte or, or Gruyere cheeses, uh, they're pretty similar, are actually pretty good on their own. And they also pair really well with starches, like the bread you have. They're superb melted over potatoes. And there's actually an interesting story about, <laughs> about what makes the French so to the French. Um, there's, always, there's, there's always been a long-standing war over who came up with Gruyere cheese, the Swiss or the French. And the Swiss have this appellation contrôlé, which means you're only allowed to name Gruyere cheese Gruyere if it meets certain Swiss standards and blah, 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 blah. So the French came up with their own grading system. When they take a Gruyere cheese, they can rate it on a scale of 20 points for all sorts of different variables. If it is 13 points or higher, I believe, it's considered superior and is allowed to be classified as a comté. Those that don't make the grade are called Gruyere. <laughs> so that's their way of getting back at the Swiss, saying, fine, you take the name, we have a better one. Mm -hmm. um, so going back to iron and carbon, if you look at the phase diagram for iron and carbon, um, does anyone, has anyone not ever seen a phase diagram? Oh, good. Okay. <laughs> so, if you look at the phase diagram for iron and carbon, this line all the way at the edge is how much carbon is actually soluble in ferrite at these temperatures. Beyond this, you start to form other phases. For example, perlite, which you see in a second, or cementite, which are actually these grains of iron-3 carbide. Um, and that on the next slide, you can actually see this is what uh, medium to high carbon steel tends to look like. If you actually sort of connect the dots here, you can see that there are fairly large grains of perlite. And inside each of these grains, the metal has undergone a phase separation into carbon-poor ferrite, which is nice and tough and acts as a strong backbone for these dark bands of iron-3 carbide or cementite which provide a lot of the hardness of the material. So you might, by fine-tuning the heat treatment and the carbon content of the steel, as we saw on Friday, um, you can really dial in whatever properties you want, uh, which are, I thought was pretty interesting. And if you look at the torn face of the Comte cheese, you'll actually see that, I think in everybody's samples of cheese, you have a few of those lactic acid crystals on the front. Well, there's a reason they tend to end up on these torn faces is because these secondary particle precipitates act as stress concentrators, which we'll actually go through a little later. Um, so I just thought that this picture was fairly striking. This is a piece of that Alcator steel, um, and these are precipitates of manganese sulfide that came out on the surface. This was literally just a bar of steel that we tore in half, and surprise, surprise, on the fracture surface was these precipitates of manganese sulfide. And on the fracture surface of all of your cheeses, were these precipitates of lactic acid. And I thought this was strikingly similar. Uh, and I wasn't listening to anything that the cheese folks were saying at this point, because after two of these, I was like, there's much more interesting things to be learned than this. So moving on. Creep lifetime and failure. Uh, to demonstrate this phenomenon, we have the Bluvi Abbe de Belloc, which is at about four o'clock, and that's paired with the confiture of black cherries from a similar region in France. What I'd like you guys to do is to take your piece of sheep's milk cheese and put it on the edge of your plate so that it's actually resting sort of like so. If this is the edge of the plate, your piece of cheese will look like this. So just leave it there and try not to eat it um, while I talk a little bit. That's okay, I don't actually can't use it anymore. But that's, thank you for very much. Um, creep is an interesting phenomenon. Um, it can cause failure of different metals well below their rated strengths or yield stress because metals tend to deform under a static load due to the movement of dislocations 
or vacancies or by some other mechanisms in the actual metal itself. And this can cause unexpected wall thinning and failure of some parts, especially in T91, which should be of particular interest to the core group. So I'm sure you guys have already found out that creep lifetime is one of the limiting factors to how hot you can make T91 and how long your fuel cycle can be. <coughs> and these creep mechanisms generally speed up with temperature. They tend to take into they tend to come into effect at about 0.5 to 0.6 times the melting point. And in terms of absolute temperature, this cheese is at like, you know, 0.8 or 0.85. It, it's already getting fairly greasy, and it doesn't take a lot to melt a cheese with this much fat. Um, so to figure out how to dial in the properties of a steel like T91, we use these dyes, heat treatment diagrams right here. I realize that the uh, axes are a little hard to see, but this axis right here shows Vickers hardness. Basically, the harder the metal is, uh, or sorry, the larger the number is, the harder the metal is. When a metal is really hard, as you saw, it's difficult to deform. Who is, so for those who were here on Friday, we took that piece of W1 tool steel. And when it's fairly hard, it doesn't flex very much. However, it can be extremely brittle. And for those of you who remember, after we quenched that piece of W1 steel to make it extremely hard, I threw it on the ground and a piece shattered off, which is not normally what you would want to happen in a very tough steel. At the other end of the spectrum, if you heat treat it for a long time, and you bring it here, it, let's say this axis right here is temperature, and you let it heat treat for a long time, form some other phases, you can trace your hardness line down, and it can get to a point where it's too soft. So there, you're not in very much danger of the T91 or whatever metal breaking in half all unexpectedly. However, it can creep fairly quickly. Um, T91 is an interesting steel. It has carbines and carbonitrides finely dispersed throughout the matrix, which actually act as pinning points for these dislocations. So as they move through the metal, they get stopped by these particles. And it really depends on a very fine and dense dispersion of these carbides and carbonitrides. Keeping T91 at too high of a temperature for too long can actually cause these particles to coarsen, which means one, they get bigger, and two, there's fewer of them because the smaller ones get absorbed by the bigger ones. And that can lower the creep lifetime of T91 and lead to failures like this. So I wouldn't have wanted to have been around when this pipe split open like that. T91 is used uh, a lot in fossil boilers, supercritical boilers, very high temperature and high pressure steam. And if you, if you do your heat treatment wrong and you don't check the hardness of the steel, this can happen all of a sudden unexpectedly with pretty much no warning. Once, basically what happens is, if you have, uh, let me just space, if you have a pipe of let's say T91 with a certain thickness T, and you have a pressure which is much larger on the inside than the outside, this will exert a force, and over time, even with just this non-varied static load, it'll actually cause the wall to thin out. The pipe will begin to stretch out. And once that pipe wall thickness reaches a minimum size, it's beyond its rated, th it's beyond its rated thickness, it bursts. Um, so at this point, I'd like you guys to take a look at your sheep's milk cheese. Pick it up and see if it's still nice and flat like it was before, or has it picked up a bit of a bend. Does anyone have some bending going on? Yeah? And notice how if you hold it so the bend is sticking up, it's not coming back down again. It's pretty much deformed irreversibly. This actually works better with a thinner piece of cheese. Um, so for those of you with really thick pieces, the effect may not be as pronounced, and you can just go ahead and eat it. Um, <laughs> For those of you with thinner pieces of cheese, this cheese is, that pretty much illustrates what creep is. If you have a bar of metal, and let's say it can certainly, it's rated to support its own weight sticking off of a beam or something under gravity. After a long amount of time, it will start to sag. And that's not because it's, it's a, you know, the stress is above its rated stress. That's because creep mechanisms are going into effect. Um, creep actually is one of the main limiters for lead fast reactor performance. So I've tried to tune this cheese class to go along with the lead reactor stuff that you guys are doing. Um, two steels that were developed for lead fast reactors, HT9 and 
mod 9 chrome 1 moly, also known as T91, are shown here. And if you look at the ruptured lifetime at, let's say, 50 megapascals, let's say the fission gases will never get higher than that, trace along here, you're at about the 20,000 hour mark. Does anyone know how long that is in years? So there's about 8,700 hours in a year. So that's two and a half years. You don't want to reach the end of your pre rupture lifetime. So this could be the thing that limits your fuel cycle. How long can T91 actually stay in a reactor? Uh, because as those fuel pins start to swell, the fission gases build up, the walls will start to thin out. And this can be, along with corrosion, one of the things that really limits performance. So I actually tried this creep experiment at home. Um, I let it go for a lot longer than five minutes. I think I gave it about an hour. I just put a knife and a plate and a piece of the sheet's milk cheese and I came back and it had completely deformed like that. Um, this will happen to metals on a much longer time scale or at a much higher temperature and a longer time scale. But the processes are quite similar looking out from the outside. So moving on to defects and stress concentrations. Uh, well, first of all, am I going too fast? Do you guys still have a lot of cheese left from the first three? All right, well, looks pretty happy, all right. Um, <laughs> moving on to the Soto Cenare al Tartufo. Uh, what I first want you guys to do is put your nose close to this fourth cheese and smell it. Anything distinct? Has anyone ever smelled truffles before? So. This is the unmistakable, unreproducible, and you know, never can't be copied, no substitutes, etc. <laughs> smell of black truffles, and you all probably know black truffles as an extremely expensive ingredient. I don't think so. It takes so little of a black truffle to produce that much aroma. That pound for pound, black truffles really aren't that expensive. The only problem is getting enough money to buy one at once, and can you really even use it? Uh, by the end, you know, by the time it's going to spoil. So, it's kind of out of the realm of individuals to have entire truffles. It goes better with restaurants, but the amount of truffle in there is minuscule. And yet the effect is extremely strong. So, the texture of this cheese is quite nice, it's pretty compliant, but the real star of the show is the truffles. But before you eat it, we want to do some tensile experiments on it. So, in a, let's say you have a, a regular piece of metal, it's not perfect. In fact, no, no piece of metal is perfect. Everything is going to have some sort of defect in it, whether it be inclusions or voids or vacancies or irradiation-induced defects or anything. And these flaws or cracks or scratches on the surface from mechanical processing, and these flaws all produce stress concentrations in a material. And the, the concentration in stress uh, from a flaw is not dependent on the absolute size, but rather on the geometry. Like the ratio, let's say it's an elliptical flaw, of the major to the minor axes, or the radius of curvature of the crack tip. And the, so the sharper the flaw is, the worse it is. As a, if something was atomically smooth, it would theoretically have an infinite stress concentration and just propagate a crack forever. Now luckily there are crack, crack blunting mechanisms and such that stop this, but the math would work out as such if you had a perfectly sharp crack. And this just sort of demonstrates what's going on. Some folks in Japan have just, just um, invented a elastoluminescent coating, a coating that actually changes its, the color that it outputs depending on the amount of stress. And what they did is they took a piece of steel, they put a crack in it, and were able to use this coating to visualize the resulting stress concentration. So if you have a piece of T91 that's rated to a certain megapascal yield stress, and you've got a little scratch on the outside. The stress right around that scratch is going to be much higher, and the sharper the scratch or the crack, the worse it is. And that can cause metals to fail well below their bulk stress state, because the stress of this material right here can be well above the failure stress of the actual metal. So to demonstrate this, what I did was fabricated a uniaxial tensile sample out of the Soto Teneri cheese, making sure to have some defects in the cheese. There is an inclusion, a fleck of truffle, and there was a void, a gas bubble in the cheese. And what I did is I just took it from both ends and in one direction pulled it apart. The first time I pulled it apart, look what showed up on the fracture surface. That shiny area right there is the void. So it has one effect of reducing the surface area in the metal, 
or, or the T's that you're holding on, but the real effect is it concentrates the stress around it. And then I took the rest of the, the piece of cheese, I pulled it again, and it broke at the truffle. So what I'd like you guys to do, you notice you all have a long thin sample of this cheese. Pick it up, pull on it, look at the fracture surface, and tell me if you see any imperfections in it. Boyer? What else? Did anyone, was anyone able to break the cheese with no absolutely no fractures surface, like no voids, no inclusions, or anything on it. It's possible that you have a section without any flaws, but not likely in this cheese, because this has both kinds of three-dimensional defects. If you hold it up to the light, you'll see sort of a shimmer as the void reflects the light at you. Um, and if you don't get it the first time, pull it again. And the, the, the key here is to pull it in one direction. You don't want to tear it because then you're actually putting it into shear loading. The whole point of a uniaxial tensile specimen is the stress is applied on only one axis. But, uh, so, did anyone have voids in their sample? Yeah. Did anyone have truffles on the fracture surface of their sample? Okay, so now, go ahead and eat it. And you will get this unmistakable aroma of truffles, especially as you breathe in and breathe out, that, that aroma is really strong and stays with you a long time. Some people like it, some people hate it, but there's no mistaking it. The honey that it's paired with is actually a miele di melata. It's not a flower honey, but a honeydew honey. Uh, this honey is made from the sap of spruce trees after aphids and plant hoppers bite into the leaves. The bees actually go and collect this sap and bring it back and make it into a much more mineral rich honey because it's not made with pollen and such, but rather it's made with the sap from the leaves, which is more rich in minerals, a little less sugar, a little hint of bitterness that's actually kind of nice. And the reason I paired the melata honey with the soto chinare cheese is both of which are very strong. If you had a really light honey or a crisp fruit like a pear or something in the soto chinare cheese, it would just be the cheese that you'd taste. You need a strong accompaniment to stand up to a strong cheese. Conversely, you need a light accompaniment to go with a light cheese. So you would want to take, for example, those black cherries and pair it with uh, something Swiss, for example. The Swiss has that nice aroma that you don't want to get overpowered. Um, yeah, so that seems to work pretty well. Side by side, these fracture surfaces are amazingly similar. This is another piece of the Alcator steel. When we pulled it apart, we found cleavage planes indicative of intergranular fracture, and we also found a nice hemispherical void. This is the, the first try I pulled apart this cheese. If you rotate this picture 90 degrees, it's the same picture. A void of about the same size on the, on the screen was found, as well as a whole bunch of cleavage planes because the cheese broke um, between the curds rather than straight through the curds. So I thought this was amazingly similar. So moving on to the last cheese and the last topic for today would be sensitization and intergranular corrosion. The cheese at uh, 10 o'clock is a queso azul de Valdeón from Valdeón, Spain. It is a pretty sharp and spicy blue cheese, so if you don't like blues, try it anyway. <laughs> you might actually like it. Um, these cheeses, by the way, are quite good. They're all in the twenty to thirty dollar a pound range. You know, you, you, you get what you pay for. So if you don't like blue cheese that comes with buffalo wings, I still recommend giving this a shot. Um, the honey that it's paired with is an exceptionally rare honey. It's a miele de bergamotto or a bergamo honey. Um, do you guys like Earl Grey tea? <laughs> bergamo is the citrus fruit or the flower that actually gives Earl Grey tea its distinctive fragrance. And bergamot are also very finicky and temperamental flowers. They only grow in very certain regions. So the guy that makes this honey lives in Sicily on the coast near Mount Etna. But they don't have any bergamot there. So he actually has to take his beehives, trap the bees in them, get on a ferry, sail to Calabria, let the bees out to collect the bergamot honey in this one grove, bring them back, and let them make honey in this hive. So as you can imagine, there isn't a lot of this stuff, and it's not available all the time. So this is, this is like the, my favorite honey that I've ever had. 
So, yeah. Uh, and the reason that's paired with the blue cheese is not sort of to complement, but to contrast. Blue cheese, as you can tell, is pretty spicy. Uh, and I mean spicy. The molds that attack the blue cheese produce a whole lot of crazy compounds. And a nice, sweet floral honey, like the bergamotto, really helps take away the edge and the bite of that blue cheese while still letting you enjoy the creamy texture and the funky spices that the molds produce. So you may be asking, why did I pick this blue cheese? Well, blue cheese acts very much like a sensitized and intergranularly attacked metal, like a stainless steel. Various things can cause grain boundaries on the metal to become weaker than the actual bulk itself, including things like heating, prolonged heating at a certain temperature. Remember I said on T91, if you heat it for a while, you can start to grow those carbides. That's the key to undoing stainless steel and causing it to be weak, is you end up growing chromium carbides on the grain boundaries. What that does is it pulls chromium out of the matrix and causes the area around the grain boundaries in the stainless steel to be no longer stainless. If it doesn't have that 11% chrome, it's not going to be able to repassivate and it's susceptible to attack, which you'll see. Radiation can also cause sensitization. There's a, uh, there's a phenomenon called radiation-induced segregation, especially in fast reactors like the LFR. It can cause metals like chromium to move away from the grain boundaries and nickel and iron to move towards the grain boundaries, which again can cause the grain boundaries to become extra susceptible to all sorts of horrible things, like liquid metal and brittlement, which does happen to a lot of steels in the good lead. So just to show you what unsensitized and sensitized steels look like, this is a piece of 304 stainless steel. It appears to have been electro-polished. It's just sort of got this signature. That's, that would be my guess. At any rate, notice that the grain boundaries are really thin, and they've actually been highlighted by the etching. Over here, what happened? These black areas are chromium carbides that have grown on the steel. And the area around each of these carbides is depleted in chromium. This is what can happen. Uh, intergranular corrosion and attack. This is a piece of alloy 600, which by the way was used in a lot of the steam generators for the Gen 1 and Gen 2 light water reactors in the US and all over the world. This particular one was in uh, a hydrogen sulfide environment, so I imagine it has something to do with oil. But as you can see, it just cracks right along those grains. It follows this sort of zigzag pattern. You can tell it's going around one grain to the other. Another example. Um, alloy 600 TT, which stands for thermally treated, immersed in a solution containing 500 parts per billion of lead. I should mention, uh, nickel is extremely soluble in lead, and so I imagine the lead would have something to do with leaching out nickel from around the grain boundaries, which had been sensitized already, and causing that to break apart. Uh, alloy 600 TT is an interesting alloy. It was used in a lot of steam generator U-tubes, so the inner tubes that hold the primary coolant in the steam generator, which is just a heat exchanger, were made of alloy 600 TT. But there was a whole batch of this 600 TT that was not TT, wasn't thermally treated, especially considering the welds, which tend to get really brittle because of this so-called heat affected zone, were not stress relieved afterwards, so the welds had a high stress in them and the slightest bit of corrosion or extra whatever. Come on up, come on up, let's run and grab a cheese plate, by the way. <laughs> Surprise! Yeah. Um, so, where was I? Uh, oh, those tubes ended up rupturing, which had to be plugged, which derated the heat exchanger and derated the plant. That's not the one you're going to want. You're going to want one that has... Yeah. Oh, they're already set up. They're already set up. <laughs> okay. yeah. So we're actually on the cheese at 10 o'clock, the queso azul. Um, if you look closely at the queso azul, if, if any of you actually haven't left, um, it behaves strikingly similar to a sensitized and intergranularly attacked uh, steel. If you look at it closely, you'll see that there are big holes where the mold has begun to attack away at the curd. But if you look even closer, you'll start to see these sort of cracks forming in between the curds. Um, some of you, if it's not all gone, may also notice you have some perfectly spherical holes in your blue cheese, which come as a cross-section of right here. Does anyone know why those are there? Does anyone know how blue cheese is made? So, blue cheese requires two things in order to blue. It requires a mold. 
a special mold and it requires oxygen. So when you mix up the milk and the rennet to make this blue cheese, you add in a starter culture of mold, which looks like this thick, greenish blue, like electric green blue liquid. And once the cheese starts to harden, you actually pierce it all throughout the side, allowing oxygen to enter the cheese, to fuse through it, especially in these intergranular spaces, and promote the growth of the mold. And so if any of you have those hemispherical holes, you'll notice that they tend to be pretty much filled in or covered with mold, which is, I thought was pretty interesting. So that's how good blue cheese is made. And then it is aged for a while, and any combination of effects and oxygen, temperature, humidity, and such can cause the cheese to be hard or soft, to have slight blue veining, or for, you know, a whole lot of blue veining. Has anyone ever seen a really nice veined blue cheese where you can see it take zigzag paths around? This particular cross-section didn't have any of those perfect veins in formation, but that same effect is happening all the time. And if you look at, I took a really close picture, you can see here, there are some veins just starting to form. And when you put that side by side with the Alloy 600 thermally treated steel, um, I was sort of amazed at, it's like the same thing, except you can't eat the one on the left. Um, so also, I imagine a lot of you guys have some cheeses left. I find that the bread is an excellent palate cleanser between the cheese, uh, between each course of cheese, as well as just to sort of wash the taste out of your mouth. Um, I think that is the whole presentation. Yeah, it's the whole one for today. So does anyone have any questions about the metals, the concepts, the cheeses, the accompaniments, or anything from today? Enjoy <laughs> <laughs> yourself. I got these cheeses from a store in Cambridge called Formaggio Kitchen, uh, but there are, like, Central Bottle has them just down the street, uh, and there's a lot more popping up all over the place, so any nice cheese store is going to have a whole lot of these things, and I actually plan to do this class every year if I get to teach it again with different cheeses, so if anyone else happens to have an interesting cheese that you know just behaves amazingly <laughs> like a metal or a ceramic or any other material, feel free to let me know. Make my life a little easier. Who is this cheese? What? Every time I eat cheese now, I'm going to be like... <laughs> <laughs> well, that's one, that's one good benefit. The other benefit, too, would be if somebody mentions yeah, yeah. intergranular fracture, you may not necessarily remember what a micrograph looks like, but just take a look at blue cheese, and that'll reinforce the concept. Yeah. So does this help make things a little more accessible? I know I've thrown a whole lot of crazy material science stuff at you in, like, 40 minutes. But hopefully, I'll see a little bit of consideration of these phenomena in the final report, especially from the folks that are dealing with higher temperature things. How are you going to deal with creep, or are you going to pick a material that's creep resistant? And if you do pick a creep resistant material, is it corrosion resistant with whatever environment you're looking at? Uh, what sort of heat treatment might you have to give your structural materials so that they're not just going to either fall apart or shatter should there be some sort of pressure transient or something, or a reactivity transient. So hopefully this will help. Uh, these are all sort of, I would call, ancillary concerns for the final report. I don't expect you to dial in an exact stress and do a detailed materials analysis, but that's not the point of this course. But if you are working with high temperature, high strength materials, and the final presentation is open to the public, you're going to get some oddball questions from material science, because we have a lot of material folks in the department. So this way, you guys will be at least prepared to understand what they're talking about instead of saying, like, can you please explain the question? Because you never want that to happen. Um, so I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you.